So I study gender inequality in the workplace. And because I'm an academic and therefore obsessed with detail and complexity, I take a very nuanced view of the topic, which is this. Everything is terrible. <laughs> now, I will spare you the uh, usual statistics about the lack of female CEOs and politicians and venture-backed entrepreneurs because we already know this. Right? We know that across all measures of professional attainment, men appear to outdo women. And the most all-encompassing of these is, of course, the gender wage gap, which is a global phenomenon. You can observe it in literally every country, including places like Iceland and Sweden, that we tend to think of as paragons of gender equality. And if you turn back the clock 30 or 40 years, you could be forgiven for thinking very clearly that it wasn't supposed to be like this. The word that scholars often use when describing the current state of progress is stalled. Because from the 1970s to the 1990s, we observed changes in the workplace that were nothing short of seismic. Entire professions that had been male only became integrated in terms of gender in a very short span of time. Women began graduating from universities at rates that equaled, and then in some cases exceeded, that of men. And the wage gap continued to narrow. Until, in the 1990s, we hit a wall. So, if you look at the average gender wage gap in 2010, it doesn't look that different from 1998. Something is very clearly broken here. And the question that animates my research and the research of others in my field is what can we do about it? How can we fix it? I want to go back to a change that began in the US in the 1990s, right around the time our, pro our progress on the wage gap stalled out. So in 1996, a woman named Sharon Hayes published a book called The Cultural Contradictions of Motherhood. And this book introduced into the academic lexicon the term intensive mothering. What is intensive mothering? Intensive mothering is the taken-for-granted assumption that a woman should prioritize the needs of her children over all other obligations in her life, over her career, over her romantic partner, over relationships with uh, friends and extended family, and it almost goes without saying, over her own physical and emotional health. And I want to focus on the taken-for-granted bit for a minute, because I think that's partly what makes the whole enterprise so insidious. Nobody sits there and consciously thinks, like, right now I'm intensively mothering. They would just call it mothering. And they would not say, wow, this is like gold medal quality parenting that I'm delivering. I should maybe you know, get some credit for that. Maybe that's something I can feel good about. They would just say, this is the standard. This is just what parenting is. I want to give you a sense of this change in two pictures. The first picture captures what I like to think of as a dominant approach to parenting in the 50s and 60s. So here we have uh, mom enjoying a cocktail, having a conversation with another adult, and by and large, not fretting so much about screen time, which of course stands in very stark contrast to the way we parent now, which I like to think of as being captured by this picture. So this is from the movie Bad Moms, uh, and here we see Mila Kunis obviously dressed for work, um, frantically throwing together what I'm going to say is like a gluten-free quinoa frittata um, for her ungrateful children. And you'll notice dad is not in the picture. So more on that in a bit. So intensive mothering describes a constellation of child-focused behaviors that we now think of as relatively normative as opposed to extravagant. So things like long-duration breastfeeding, two years according to the WHO, which past a certain number of months is not guaranteed to convey any health benefits to your child, but is statistically associated with reduced earnings. Or the idea that the optimal way to manage a crying child is to hold the child indefinitely. And, you know, if that interferes with luxuries like using the toilet or 
putting food in your mouth, things like that. Um, this is just what you signed up for, right? That's just what parenting is. Or going out of your way to purchase food that happens to be labeled organic, even though, and this is true, it's very, very difficult to find credible scientific evidence that this is in any way better or safer for your children. Or overseeing an ever-expanding roster of organized leisure activities, from sports to music to theater, while still project managing the dinners and the bath times and the bedtimes and the school runs and everything else. So intensive mothering describes a constellation of behaviors, but underlying all of them is a common ideology, one of perpetual self-sacrifice. And this is kind of new, because for the vast majority of the 20th century, the adults were the most important people in the room. And then at some point, that stopped being the case. At some point, it seems like we all took a vote, and we decided that the kids were more important, so long as women were primarily, if not entirely, responsible for delivering on that conviction. So, this has some uh, very clear implications, obviously, uh, with respect to how uh, women allocate their time. Um, so, for example, time diary surveys now suggest that women uh, spend more time, working women now, spend more time with their children than stay-at-home mothers did in the 1960s. This is what sociologists mean when they talk about uh, clocking into the second shift. That's what mothers do as soon as they come home from work. Now, I want to bring fathers into the picture for a minute. Um, these same time diary studies suggest that fathers are spending more time with their children now than ever before, and that's great. That's really great. But let's be honest, the bar was kind of low in terms of what was going on before. And you still see these really interesting distinctions in terms of uh, how fathers do this childcare. So for example, fathers tend to do the bulk of their share on the weekends, when it's much less likely to conflict with paid work. And fathers tend to assume responsibility for household tasks that have this like nice discretionary component in terms of when they actually have to get done, right? So like taking out the trash, mowing the lawn, putting up a shelf or a painting, there's a pretty big window in terms of when you actually have to accomplish those tasks. But fetching the kids from school every day, feeding them dinner every night, not so much, right? The timing for those tasks is fairly inflexible. And relatedly, we see that uh, from survey data, at least in the US, men do not reduce their paid work hours when they become parents. But women often do. And part of this, of course, is governed by the social norms around masculinity, the idea that a man's primary responsibility to his family remains breadwinning. So by that conception of fatherhood, working the same number of hours, or even increasing your work hours, that constitutes good parenting, which is then reinforced by the unyielding social pressure that men face from their supervisors and occasionally from their coworkers not to adjust their hours downward at all when they become parents, even though many, of course, would like to. So it would be a little bit reductive, but I think still accurate, to say that fewer work hours uh, leads to lower earnings and an arrested career progression for mothers compared with fathers. And there's a, a great working paper by Henrik Clevin and his colleagues that uh, demonstrates this very clearly, right? So I'm going to show you two graphs. Here we see uh, on, on the left side a comparison of the earnings trajectory of women who have children compared to women who do not have children. Just to be clear, the line that's plummeting that's the earnings of women with children. Whereas, the same comparison for men yields no discernible difference. So, the earnings of men who have children is not statistically different from the earnings of men who do not have children. And these data, by the way, come from Denmark. So, egalitarian, social justice Denmark. This is why there are scholars who believe that the gender wage gap is primarily, not entirely, but primarily a motherhood penalty. And it could be why uh, the wages of childless women often look very similar to 
if not indistinguishable from, the wages of men in large-scale survey data sets. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that most of what I've talked about so far has come as a surprise to exactly none of the women in the room. Um, so in my remaining time, I'd like to talk a little bit about solutions. Specifically, I want to talk about a single guiding principle that may be able to make a difference were it diligently and consistently applied. Now, this remains fairly untested, scientifically speaking, so I'm not going to tell you that it works. But I think it could work. And I'm hoping that some of you might be interested in helping us, which is to say researchers, especially this researcher, find out. Here's what I'm asking you to do. When it comes to evaluating your employees, reward outputs, not inputs. What do I mean by that? Outputs are the actual work product, whatever it is the person is ultimately meant to produce. It's the quality of their code, the size of the new account signed, the longevity of the patient after treatment, whatever. This is what raises and bonuses and promotions are meant to be calibrated towards, in theory. In practice, we don't actually reward outputs. And I'm speaking broadly here with respect to white-collar professional roles. Of course, there are exceptions. But in general, regardless of what is written down in a formal job description or a company mission statement, we tend to reward the inputs. We venerate people who work a lot of hours because we view that as a proxy for commitment and dedication. And those seem like good things. We prioritize people who work late in the office because we view that as a proxy for effectiveness. That's why, incidentally, your coworkers will take every opportunity to let you know just how hard they're working. Right? We've all had that conversation, like, oh, I'm so tired. I was working on the model to 11 last night. Maybe we've even said that a few times. But it's clear what they want you to hear, right? Look at me. I'm a rock star. I'm gunning for that promotion. That's the subtext. But what that should make you wonder is, why did it take you so long? Why aren't you better at your job? Why should the least efficient worker have the strongest claim for that promotion? How many hours you spent on the model is an input, and it's not hugely relevant. Is your model accurate? Is it predictive? That's relevant. That's the output. I think this matters because the way we've tried to address the gender wage gap so far doesn't seem to be working, at least on its own. We've tried to enforce a standard of equal pay for equal work. This is hugely important in its own right. It is absolutely a moral and a legal imperative. It is also guaranteed to fail. As long as equal work continues to be defined, however informally, by its inputs. Because what we now have, then, is a state of affairs where equal work, by that definition, is much more difficult for mothers to achieve. So what I'm asking you to do is re change your definition of equal work. Ensure that a man and woman whose outputs are identical are rewarded identically. Let's not just assume that more uh, face time and more travel time is necessarily going to lead to better outcomes. That's an assumption that I think is going to be true much less often than we might think. So, what does it look like when you focus on outputs? A few things change. So, first thing that changes is when it's feasible, you care a lot less about where your employees work, whether it's in the office or at home. And just to be clear, I'm not talking about trading the office for the home indefinitely here. I'm talking about giving your employees discretion every day over where they do their work more or less treating them as if they were adults, basically. Um, there have now been uh, three very rigorous field experiments conducted on the effects of remote working, uh, one of them by me, and there just does not seem to be a ton of downside. Depending on the context, there is quite a bit of upside. A second thing that changes is hiring, because the only thing that should matter when you're hiring is how well a person performs in the role for which they're being considered. So if you're hiring someone to be a programmer, have them code right in front of you. If you're hiring them to 
write advertising copy, have them do that in real time. This is much more diagnostic of future performance, it turns out, than having some funny anecdotes and lots of personal traits in common with the interviewer. It tends to be less diagnostic. A third thing that changes is how we go about measuring and assessing all these outputs. And I'm not going to lie, this is the really hard part. This is the tricky bit. Because it's easy and straightforward to promote people based on their inputs. And more than that, it feels good. It feels right. It feels like you're incentivizing the right behavior. It is much more difficult to objectively define what top performance looks like in a particular setting and then apply that standard consistently across all employees. Difficult but essential, especially the part about consistency, because otherwise you get a lot of, you know, like he's assertive, we like that, versus she's bossy and we don't like that. So these examples only scratch the surface. Um, I'm just going to conclude by reiterating what I'm asking you to try. Care less about where your employees work, or when they work, or how many hours they work, or their work history, so long as the work they do for you is of the highest standard. Reward what your employees do, not how they do it. I'm very curious to see what the results of that would be. Thank you.